Have you tried modeling a tensor test specimen? Do you want to gain insight about how to design a tensor test specimen and extract material properties from that specimen? This is what I'm going to be showing you in this video so that at the end you gain insight as to how a tensor specimen can be designed numerically and what possible results you can generate from such specimen. Let's sit back and relax as we get started with this modeling. All right, so the first thing we're going to do is to review the theory around what we're trying to do. So let's look at what we are basically trying to do here. So the first thing is, what is the specimen design that we're going to explore here? And this is a specimen design. It's basically a cylindrical shaped dog bone splinter specimen. So this would normally look like this with the central region being the gauge section and the two ends being the gripped region. And then the picture in the middle here tells you of the different sets where the material can be held. So we're going to be hold, holding it at the top and the, and the bottom end. And then in the middle right here is the gauge section. And this will be what the mesh arrangement will look like. Looking more closely as to what the specific dimensions will be because we need this as we create the sample. So this is what the cross section of the sample will look like. So basically, if you look at it here, so I'm going to have to design the downside of it and then revolve it around 360 degrees, generate this cylindrical specimen. And so these are the numbers that are associated with this. So basically the coordinate positions of this downside are identified here and the grips will have a length of 15 millimeters for the grip regions. It's got a diameter of 20 millimeters for the grip regions, while the gauge section will have a diameter of 10 millimeters and it's got a total length of 40 millimeters for the gauge section. So these are the dimensions that we're going to be using for this sample. Now, to look at more closely on what the boundary condition that we're going to impose on this to recreate the sensor test specimen that we're looking at. And this is to mirror what we normally see in experiment. So if you look more closely here, right at the base end here, the structure is going to be held securely. So this will be like what you will see in an experiment where the anvils will hold the sample securely. And then on the other end and the top right end, we would end up having the displacement load, which will be the cross head, you know, the grip connected to a cross head pulling the structure apart. And in this instance, we're going to prescribe a displacement of delta L. And then it's grip securely at the base, loaded from the front using a displacement loading condition. And right in the middle, we've got the gauge length, which I said it's about 40 millimeter in length. I've not used any standard here, but if you want to use any standard, of course, these dimensions will change according to the standard you're using. The essence of this video is just to show you how to set up a tensile specimen using a cylindrical dog bone sample. If this is the kind of content that you like, please do subscribe to this channel. So when contents like this are made, you'll be the first to see it. And also, if you like, you can leave any comment in the comment section of this video of what you think about the whole tensile testing specimen. Do you use the standards? What standards do you use? What kind of materials are you testing? What other things would you like to know associated with testing of tensile specimens and I would like to make those kind of videos to support you to give you this insight as to what is going on with your tensile testing. So we're going to go into Abacus and actually build up this model and try and explore what we're going to generate from it. All right so here we are in Abacus and the first thing we need to do is to create the tensile test specimen that we're interested in. So how do we do that? So we go to the parts here and I'm going to call it a dog bone cylindrical just because it's got a cylindrical shape as against maybe a rectangular strip shape or any kind of tensile test specimen shape. This is cylindrical that we're dealing with. So it's going to be made in 3D. It's going to be deformable and the base feature shape will be solid. And then the type of mechanism I'm going to use to create this will be a revolution because I'm going to create the cylindrical specimen revolution. This is the easiest way to do this. And then we'll click continue. So now I want the sample to be horizontal as against being vertical you know just for easy display so what i'm going to do is i'm going to delete this current construction line and then i'll create a new construction line for myself so this will be the new construction line that i'm going to use to orient the sample around so then we can now create the coordinates so using this point option so i'll create the coordinates so one of the first coordinates is minus 45 zero so that will be right at this point and we know that down here it will be minus 45 minus 10 because this is half the cross section of the grip so it goes far as far as going all the way somewhere around here i know that each square here is five millimeters so three of them will give me 15 which is what we wanted and then i'll jump two steps and i'll come back here four one two three four then we'll come back here then go there and then another three so basically this way we're able to generate the whole cross section 
one cross section that we're going to revolve around. I don't really want these ends this way, so I'm going to press down shift and delete them. And then I'm going to replace them with an, a tangent in you know, an arc for easy uh, evolution of the cross section from a straight line to an arc. So we're going to use this create arc tangent to adjacent curve. So we start from where we want the tangent to exist and then we go to the other end. So we do the same thing and go to the other end and then cancel procedure. So now we have the complete cross section as we want it to be. So I click done. Now, what it will ask me is how much revolution do I want? I want it to be 360 degree all around. So this will create the sample that I'm looking for. And this is what I meant that I wanted it to be horizontal. So this is basically the sample that we wanted. There are a few things that we're going to do because I'm going to be interested in the gauge section. The next step in this process is to partition and isolate that gauge section. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to rotate it so that I can see clearly an edge. So there's an edge here that we're going to be using. Now I'll use this option which says partition the cell by defining a cutting plane. So I'll click on that and I'm going to use normal to edge. So this is why I wanted to have an edge initially. So this is the edge that I want and which point am I going to partition right there, which is the end point of the gauge section. So if we click on the sample, so it shows, okay, this is where we are and this is fine. So we'll do the same thing. I'll just click on that again, click on that same edge, done normal to edge and then click, select the edge and click the point where I'm interested in partitioning which is probably around here and then create my partition so everything is fine so if I check in the middle you find that okay the system now has a clear region which is a gauge section the other thing that we're going to do is to actually isolate that gauge section so I'll create a set which I'm going to call my gauge section just to identify this gauge section done that's probably about all that we need so if we switch the back to set so it shows us clearly that our gauge section, which is where we're going to extract our properties are all finely defined and everything is okay here. Now, the next thing we need to do is, okay, so can we mesh the domain? Fine, we can mesh it. So I'll click on that. So it's assuming four, okay, four may be fine. However, I want this gauge section to be finely meshed. So I need to then do an edge seeding of this mesh. So we're going to use this option, which says seed edge. So I'll select that edge. And then, because this is the region where I'm going to extract all my stress and strain data. So the approximate element size is picking up the four we wanted initially. So I could change that to one. And that basically means I'm finally meshing that region using a final seed in that region. So now that we have those two partitions con conducted, so we need to also create a partition at the end. Because if you're looking at this, it doesn't seem to show that it's going to mesh easily. So you want all the colors to be yellow so that you can use a sweep mesh across but currently it's identifying this as problematic parts and so it's difficult to mesh so what we're going to do is to partition them further partitioning always helps with meshing so we'll go back to this and click on that button so select the cell so we want to partition this end first done now we want to do normal to edge as usual so we we'll rotate it and find where the edge lie okay so this is the edge so we we'll select that edge and then click on that point so that creates a partition. So you can see now it's nicely identifying that different meshing algorithm, meshing technique will fit in for the two ends. So the other part that is a bit brownish here, we also need to do the same. So we select that, done. So we want to do normal to edge, we click on that point and click there, and then create partition. So now we have a uniform color that tells us that we can use the same meshing um, technique for all of them. And, and so that's exactly what we're going to do next. So basically here, so we've meshed, so we now select on this meshing of the region. So we select all that. And then the mesh, and then the meshing that we're going to use is a sweeping mesh with a dominant element shape of hexahedral. And we are going to use a media axis. Okay, so this is fine. And then we can then go ahead and mesh. So this way we now have an excellent mesh with the gauge section region finally mesh. Let's look at this set. So so our set will create a set for this gauge section. So I'm going to call it gauge section and select just the middle region okay this is fine so we could also select sex you know so maybe grip top so which will be this region and then we'll create another set and do this again grip base which will be that region so if we switch this to set so you can see it shows us different arrangements of different regions with the base and the top exactly as they should be so we've got all that so the next thing we then need to move on to do next is to look at the materials so in this kind of case i'm going to model it using a steel material 
So I'm going to model using a steel material. So basically this is a steel material, so I'm going to call it Johnson Cook steel material and it's probably at the beginning I'm going to call it AISI steel and steel. So the elastic properties of steel of course we know that to be 210 but because this material has a dimension of millimeters so this 210 gigapascal will be 210 e raised to the power 3. If you really want to learn about choosing the right unit system look at this video where I talked about the right unit system for a for the Abacus model so it will help you. So this will be 210 e raised to the power 3 and then the Poisson ratio is 0.33. So we can then go on to the next case which is the plasticity. So the plasticity will switch it to a Johnson Cook material model and in the Johnson Cook material model it has all these parameters. Again please refer to my book on page 380 where it identifies all the parameters that you will use here. So just looking at this, so this will be 305 megapascal but because we are working with uh, a unit system of millimeters so it will be 305 alone no megapascal. The second value here will be 1161. The n value here is 0 0.610. The m value here is 0 0.517. The melting point of steel is probably around 1 300 uh, degrees centigrade and the transition temperature is usually something lower than that because we are not really looking at temperature effect in this kind of simulation. So it doesn't really matter what you provide here, but I'm going to put some kind of number. So let's say maybe 1000. It has to be lower than the melting point, this transition temperature. So these are the initial values. And then we're going to incorporate also a rate dependence to this model. Not because we are going to vary the intensity of our loading, but it's good to have for completeness sake, you know, a rate dependence. So the Johnson Cook material model requires two parameters to define the rate dependence. And so the C properties here will be 0 0.010. So the C property here 0 0.010. And the epsilon dot zero is a reference strain rate. So usually it's one point, a one strain rate for this material. So it's a reference strain rate. Of course, the higher the strain rate goes, the more the rate dependence comes into, into this result. But this is not what we're going to be worrying about. We're going to only focus exactly on one type of test of, of loading. So this is all that we need for defining the Johnson Cook material model. So everything here is fine. And then the next thing we then need to do is to create a section. So I'm just going to call it steel section. And we'll link that to the IC steel Johnson Cook that we already have. And then next thing is that we need to attach it to the particular material that we're working with. So we select that. I'm going to deactivate this and then make that a steel section. So this becomes, now I've told Abacus what material to model this geometry with. So we create a step. So this will be our loading step. I'm going to use a static general for this kind of simulation. Of course, if we're doing a different kind of simulation, it will be a different thing. But static general is fine. So then we create an assembly instance. So we'll click on the instance. Okay, this is fine. And then we create our boundary condition. So I'm going to call this back end fixed base. So the back end will be fixed using an initial boundary condition. So because I've already created those, those, I could say my grip at the base, which I could highlight to show me that is fine. And then I'm going to constrain it in X and Y Z direction. Of course, you can also constrain it in terms of rotation so that that wouldn't be a case but um, I will leave that, that to be. Okay, now in the front end, so I'm going to call my displacement tensile load, okay? Now it's going to be a loading step, displacement as well. So this will be the grip from the top highlighted here. So it will be loaded in the X direction, which is the one direction. The diameter of the system was 40, so uh, it's 40, the cage section. So what if we, maybe put 20 just so that we have a, you know, about a 50% strain in this material. So at least across the region. Okay. So this is fine. So now this is the setup of the material. Everything it looks okay the way it should be. So we can then just go and submit the job. So I'm going to call it job. All right. So this is the tensile specimen that has been completely completed running. And so if we animate it a bit, so you could see it's showing the right kind of deformation. So reduce the speed, so it's showing the right kind of deformation that we expected and everything looks to 
be going very well. So the concentration of the stresses is right in the gauge section. So obviously, the next thing we need to do is to visualize the quantitative data behind it, the actual stress and strain data. And that's what we're going to be doing next. So to do that, we just click on here. So we are going to use the field output option. Again, if you want to see how to extract stress and strain data from a typical simulation like this, look at the video that I put here, which will show you how to do that. So we're going to use the second method in that approach, which is a volume averaging method here. So if we click on this to continue, so clearly I'm looking for a certain element set. So the element that I'm going to work with here is the gauge section element, because that's where I'm volume averaging the stresses in that region and the strain in that region. And then the variables that we're going to be monitoring here will be the E11 variable and the S11. So this is a stress in the one one direction or the x x direction and the strain in those direction so that's what we're going to be doing so we can then save that okay so there will be a lot of them so if you look here you find that actually there's quite a lot of x y data in the sample but that's not a problem so we are going to then volume average all these properties of stress and strain for all the elements in that region by operating on the data so we click continue so you can see these are all the values so we're going to volume average using the average function here so i select the average function so it comes up in this window with the cost of blinking right here meaning that it's waiting for what to average on so i'll start from this first one and then i'll just hunt and then until where the e11 value stops so which is around there then i press down shift and select that and then there's this add to expression so now it's added that to the expression and we could then maybe save this data as so the resulting data that we're going to generate here will be let's say a s gauge section s11 no e11 average so that's our first data so then we will do the same thing so we'll clear the current expression so click on that again to do the stress case so remember we stopped here so this will start with the stress case and then go all the way to the end and then stretch pressing down shift select that so that gives that and then we we'll add it to expression so it's added as well so we can save that data so this will be data b gauge section s11 average okay so again we can clear that expression and then the final thing we now need to do is to plot the stress and strain data and we're going to use the combine option here so we'll click on the combine option there and then go all the way to the top so you see the original data that we have so the x data will be the strain the y data will be the stress so we'll double click on the strain to bring it in double click on the stress to bring that in using this combined function which is like a plotting function so once we generate that then we can say i want to plot this function and voila we have our stress strain data from the simulation so what we're going to do right at the end here is if I open up all this at the end here, so I'm going to rename that and call it my C data. So this is the gauge section S11 versus E11. They're all both average, volume average data. So this becomes the resulting data that we have. So if we go to the top end, we can see those numbers. So what I'm going to do with the C data is to look at the actual raw number so that we can make some operation on that. So if i edit this so we we'll see that data so all i need to do is to select all of those data to the end and then click right click and copy okay so this is fine so i've copied that data now i've created an excel script which we can use so i'll paste the nominal stress and the normal strain data in that region so this is sort of the data we have the nominal stress and the nominal strain calculated effectively from here and then if we look what is the modulus, the slope of the material calculated in that region? So it's given on 210 megapascal that we wanted. And then what I'm calling here as my max U strength is obviously the ultimate tensile strength, which is the biggest stress in the value. So I'm calculating that by using this function, which says the maximum of the value in that region. And so that gives us the value. So this is the stress strain data that we can generate from this. If you want to see numerical insight into another type of tensile test specimen especially with a rectangular cross section then this is the video that you want to see if you're also interested in how to operate on this stress and strain data like i mentioned earlier in the video this is the video that i want you to see thank you for interest in this video and i'll see you in the next one Bye bye